Good morning and welcome to worship at St. Andrew's Kirk. This was such a quiet and meditative group before service started. I, I wonder if it happened to, to be related. I loved the hymn that our music director, Nathan Lightborn, was playing. It's a newer hymn by Fernando Ortega called Our Great God. Uh, for those of you who are here in person, welcome. Uh, and for those watching online, we are grateful to have you uh, from wherever uh, you are watching us and worshiping with us from this morning. Uh, I, I'd like to acknowledge, I, I think it's a wonderful thing, and I, I realize during these times of COVID-19 restrictions, it's easy to grumble uh, about some of the awkward implementation of some of these restrictions, but I need to at least just say how grateful I am that given all the restrictions, given all the things that are locked down this weekend, we are allowed to gather in person to publicly worship and proclaim Jesus Christ. This is not a privilege that is given in every country, and particularly not during this uh, global pandemic. So I am grateful that we can gather in this manner, and I'm, I'm grateful that you've all showed up with masks on, and of course we continue to want to be meticulous in honoring the protocols uh, set forth, and you've been so good uh, at doing so. Uh, with that, uh, I'd like us to take a posture of worship as we sing uh, a wonderful hymn. It's number 36 in our hymn book, uh, led by Matthew Johnson, Immortal, Invisible, God Only Wise. unite our hearts in prayer. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, as we think upon you now, stretch our minds and open our hearts to receive and to rejoice in all that you are. Let us consider this great universe, the myriad of galaxies, the complexity and beauty of the planet we occupy, all of this designed by you, 
created by you and sustained by you. Lord, what an awesome being you are to be able to create and control all things. And so we bow humbly in your presence this morning and ask for a glimpse of your majesty, a glimpse of your glory. Lord, help us not to be unduly overwhelmed by it, except that it would draw us close to you and invite our worship. But as we draw close, we become aware that you are holy and we are not. And so we come with a confession of our sins and our guilt. But we remember that you loved us and you sent your Son to be an atonement for our sin. The penalty which we deserve fell upon him. And so by faith, we confess our sins to you, knowing we have an advocate, knowing we have one who has removed our guilt and given us his righteousness. So our boldness in coming to your throne of grace is all because of Christ. And we pray that you would expand our hearts to worship you, increase our capacity to follow you, and conform us even more so to the image of Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen.
spending a few months looking at 1 Peter and having concluded the series Holiness by Fire, uh, we begin a new sermon series entitled Wisdom for Life. And it is based on the book of Proverbs. If you know the book of Proverbs, uh, there is some repetition of themes throughout. And so whereas in 1 Peter we, we move meticulously along bit by bit. In Proverbs, there'll be a bit of jumping around. So if you're one to take notes or to follow along in your Bible, I encourage that, uh, but just give a warning that you'll have to have quick fingers uh, to flip pages uh, to where I lead you. And on that note, let us turn to the Lord to prepare our hearts in prayer. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we often thank you for your word, which is authoritative, relevant, and helpful. But we also thank you now for the variety in which your word takes. Sometimes it is in prophetic words, sometimes it is history uh, written for our benefit, sometimes it is personal letters. And, and here in the wisdom literature, we have Proverbs, uh, these wise sayings that are helpful and, and teach us about your character and teach us how we should live. And so I pray for your Spirit's help for me to preach and for all of us to apply these words to our hearts and to our lives. Through Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. You may well know that a great many of the Psalms are attributed to King David, and here we have his son, King Solomon, responsible for the vast majority of our biblical Proverbs. The Proverbs of the Bible are a collection of what I would call pithy statements. They are often witty, they are memorable, and they are intended to provide the follower of Christ with general guidance for how to follow God, to do his will, and to obey his commands. 
It also gives us proverbs uh, that steer us away from certain behaviors and actions as well. Here we are in the opening chapter of Proverbs, and as you might expect in the opening chapter of a book, we are given the primary theme, and the primary theme uh, teaches us about the primary path of our life, and it is the path of wisdom. The Christ follower, the God-fearer, is to follow the path of wisdom. Now, in our day, we tend to make a distinction between wisdom and knowledge, or between wisdom and information. We sometimes hear it said that wisdom is the right management of knowledge, or wisdom is the right management of information. But I need you to know that King Solomon does not make that kind of distinction. In the book of Proverbs, you will often see the terms wisdom, knowledge, and understanding used interchangeably. And this becomes obvious, for example, when you compare Proverbs 1-7 with Proverbs 9-10. In Proverbs 1-7, we are told, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. And in Proverbs 9.10, we are told the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And then if you were to look at Proverbs 2.6, we read, For the Lord gives wisdom, from his mouth come knowledge and understanding. So it's important when we hear in the book of Proverbs, wisdom, knowledge, understanding, these are three different words or three different ways of describing the same thing. But rather than attempt to define wisdom for you this morning with a single statement, or to define wisdom using this single sermon, I would like to use the breadth of the book of Proverbs and the entirety of this sermon series to frame for you a biblical portrait of wisdom. So if if you go home today and you interact with someone who says, what was the sermon about? And you say it was about wisdom. And they say to you, well, what is wisdom? You can say, well, let me tell you a few things, but I'll have to listen to the whole sermon series to give you the full picture. Uh, Because we really need the breadth of this entire biblical book to do wisdom justice. Now, it should be noted that any discussion on wisdom would be incomplete without making reference to the New Testament, namely that Jesus Christ is wisdom incarnate. That Jesus Christ is wisdom incarnate. Let me give you an example of where we see this. The Apostle Paul, when writing to the Colossians, speaks of Christ as the one in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. So as we talk about wisdom, we we understand that it not only comes from Christ, but wisdom points us to Christ, and wisdom is ultimately revealed in Christ. And so you could almost see the book of Proverbs as a trailer for a longer movie, if you will, because we understand wisdom most fully, most completely, when we look at Christ. Now, for our purposes this morning, I would simply like to begin where Solomon begins, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Now, the phrase fear of the Lord has often been misunderstood. As I've asked Christians, what do you think the Bible means to convey when it talks about the fear of the Lord? I have seen that this is a vastly misunderstood statement, the fear of the Lord. So I want to use a personal illustration to make it crystal clear 
what the fear of the Lord is not. What the fear of the Lord is not. So here's the personal illustration. Just over a week ago, it was about 5 o'clock in the afternoon, and it was time for me to feed our two cats and our four dogs, as is my custom at that time. Now, if you've never been in the McPhail home, I need to tell you that it, it can be a bit of a zoo at times. It's not a huge house, and so two cats and four dogs, you know, they're constantly underfoot, and this isn't my design, but the cats have an entire basket of toys. Yes, please don't judge me. This was not my idea. There is a basket of cat toys, and the cats, they pick out these toys, and they're strewn all over the floor. So here I am on this particular day, a week or so ago, five o'clock in the afternoon, and I'm setting down these dishes of food for my cats and for my dog. And I'm setting down the final dish of dog food. And I see something at my, my feet that makes me say to myself, oh, I didn't realize that my cats had a toy snake. And then it dawned on me that my cats don't have a toy snake that I set down this dish of dog food and at my feet was a snake. In my dining room was a snake. And I was terrified. I won't get into the whole thing about me hiding in the kitchen and Ali sorting it all out. I won't get into that here. But I need you to know that I was utterly terrified. I was a coward. I was profoundly afraid of this snake. I need you to know that this is not what Solomon means when he talks about the fear of God. Fear of God does not mean dread of God. Solomon is not suggesting that it's a good idea for us to be afraid of God or that it's wise for us to be terrified of God. I want to submit to you a better word for capturing what is meant by the fear of God, and it is the word awe. The fear of God can be best described by the word awe. It's a good word to describe how a person feels if you've ever stood at the edge of the Grand Canyon and looked over the edge. I'm told that what you feel is this sense of awe. Growing up in Niagara Falls, it never got old on me when I walked along the sidewalk along Niagara Falls and you see all of this water crashing over. You have this sense of awe. You see, there is a way to feel overwhelmed without being terrified. There is a way to feel awe without also feeling dread. A genuine experience of awe as it relates to God will always draw us to Him rather than drive us away from him. And we see this later on in Proverbs 14, verse 26, where Solomon declares, in the fear of the Lord, one has strong confidence. See, it can't mean dread. It can't mean terror. In the fear of the Lord, one has strong confidence. And his children will have a refuge. You see, the fear of the Lord draws you into him. It does not drive you away. To, to fear the Lord is to, is to possess a reverential awe that causes you to trust in his power. The fear of the Lord is to possess a reverential awe that causes you to trust in his power. God's awesome power ought not to frighten the Christian. 
For the Christian, this power is exercised on your behalf. The Christian trembles in God's presence, but we tremble in adoration, and we tremble with trust, understanding and believing that this powerful God is on our side. He's for us. This is the posture that Solomon urges us to as we pursue wisdom. Now, if we think then of the fear of the Lord as a posture or the fear of the Lord as a disposition, I'd like to now suggest that there are three practical actions that will help you to gain and to grow in wisdom. There are three practical actions which will help you to gain and grow in wisdom. The first way to gain and grow in wisdom is to pray for it. It's to pray for it. This is hinted throughout the book of Proverbs, but the urging to pray for wisdom is explicit in the New Testament book of James, chapter 1. James writes... If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given to him. I want you to be encouraged by this. Wisdom is not some secret resource that's given to a select few. Wisdom, we are told, is available to all. All who pray to God and ask for it. James is clear that there is no reluctance on the part of God to give his people wisdom. That we need to simply ask in faith, James says, that God can and will give his children wisdom when they ask for it. Now I realize People often talk about faith as the key to getting what you ask for in prayer. And that's true. Faith is the key to getting what you ask for in prayer. But I think you all know there is a way to misapply misapply faith. There's a way to misapply faith. Praying with exuberant, deep faith will not necessarily get you Something that God has not promised. I realize that's a mouthful. Let me give it to you again. Praying with exuberant, praying with deep faith, will not necessarily get you something that God has not promised. Now let me frame that in the positive. Our faith-filled prayers are effective when we ask God for something that he's promised to give us. And there's a difference because we're praying for a multitude of things. We're praying for all kinds of things that are on our mind and on our heart. And we don't always get what we ask for. But one of the realities in play is that we sometimes pray for things that God has not promised. Wisdom is not one of those things. God has promised to give wisdom to all who ask in faith. We may lament, and we do lament, that when we pray for a loved one who is sick, they don't always get better. We may pray for someone we care about who's in a really difficult situation, and the situation does not remedy itself, or at least any time soon. God doesn't promise to give us a life that goes to three, four hundred years. Our time here on earth is limited. Eventually, each and every one of us will die. And all of us, I think, can share experiences of tribulation that has gone on for quite some time. Because God has not promised a life without trouble. He has not promised a life without sickness. He has not promised a life without death. And so we ought not to be surprised that even when we pray with faith, not every difficult situation is remedied. But here's what God promises. He promises to give us the wisdom 
that will help us to navigate the most difficult and complex circumstances of our earthly life. He gives us the wisdom and the knowledge to work our way through seasons of tribulation in a manner that ultimately blesses us and gives God the glory. Now, I'm not suggesting that we stop praying for our our sick loved ones. No, keep praying for them. But just understand that when we pray for certain things, we don't necessarily have a promise of healing and deliverance. But when we do pray for wisdom, we have the promise. We can go to God with our Bibles open and say, Lord, you promised. Far be it from me to presume upon your grace. Far be it from me to presume upon your generosity. But you said in your word that you will give your children wisdom when they ask for it. Pray for wisdom. Secondly, to gain and grow in wisdom, we must obey God's commands. To gain and grow in wisdom, we must obey God's commands. We hear this principle from Moses In Deuteronomy 4, verses 5 and following, Moses declares this to the people of Israel. He says, I have taught you statutes and rules as the Lord my God commanded me that you should do them in the land that you are entering. Keep them and do them for that will be your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the people's. This description of wisdom is vital to our understanding. Wisdom is not mere discernment. It's not mere discernment. It's not merely understanding. Wisdom is not merely about what we know, but it is fundamentally about what we do. And according to Moses, a wise person behaves in a particular manner. According to scripture, wise living is equated with obedience to God's commands. Friends, I found this to be true anecdotally, but now I I, I see the scripture that confirms my experience that the most wise people I know are also the most godly, and that the most godly people I know are the most wise. Now that should help us return to the first principle of praying for wisdom because then we understand the kind of wisdom that we're asking for. We're not simply saying, Lord, give me the wisdom to know what to do, but also give me the wisdom and the capacity to behave in particular ways. So we're not just, Lord, download information but give me a capacity to do what your word says. Help me to obey your commands. Thirdly, to gain and grow in wisdom, we must listen to godly teachers. To gain and grow in wisdom, we must listen to godly teachers. Now this principle is explicit in Proverbs 1. In the third verse, Solomon refers to receiving instruction in wise dealing, which would imply that someone is teaching or someone is passing on wisdom to others. Solomon then frames this principle as an exhortation in verse 5. He says, let the wisdom hear and increase in learning, and the one who understands obtain guidance. Now many of us, I suspect, prefer speaking to listening. Many of us would prefer to be the teacher than the one being taught. And so we need to be careful here. I need to be careful here. I need to be particularly careful here. The Apostle James, or James the half-brother of Jesus, in his letter, urges us, be quick to hear, slow to speak, 
and slow to become angry. And I regret to say it could sometimes be said of Bryn McPhail that he is quick to speak and he is slow to listen. But I need to understand and we need to understand this is not the way of wisdom. The wise seek guidance. The wise listen to counselors and godly leaders. And Solomon, he, he, it's almost like he introduces this principle nicely in verses 3 and 5, but by the time you get to verse 7, if you're still working on this principle, he's got a harder word for you. He says in verse 7, fools despise wisdom and instruction. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. We don't want to be fools. And because none of us are as wise as we'd like to be, and because none of us are as wise as we ought to be, we need to position ourselves, we need to surround ourselves with godly teachers that we will listen to. And when we listen, what is it that we primarily learn? I mean, what is the main subject that we ought to give our attention to? Is it math? Is it physics? Is it anthropology? Is it political science? No. Now, these are great subjects, by the way. I don't want to discourage you if, if these are great interests to study math and physics and so on. These are important. Study them. But the subject that requires significant attention from each and every Christ follower is the subject of theology. The Christian ought to be diligent in their study of God. Solomon asserts the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Well, it's difficult, I think, to be truly in awe of something or to be truly in awe of someone if we are unfamiliar with them. I mean, I, I gave you the example of the Grand Canyon this morning. I've never been to the Grand Canyon. I mean, I've seen photographs, and, and the photographs give me some measure of appreciation. I don't know if I could say the photographs drive me to be in awe of the Grand Canyon. I think I would have to be there in person. I think I would have to, to, to be physically present in or near the Grand Canyon to experience the awe. And so, friends, I, I want to suggest the same in terms of our theology or our study of God. It's not enough for us to see a reflection of God, but we must aim to fully experience Him and know Him up close. To properly fear God, to appropriately worship God, presupposes that we are familiar, familiar with Him. And if we are familiar with Him, it will help us to fear and worship as we ought. So friends, it is my sincere desire, not only today, but throughout this series and throughout our Christian life, that each and every one of you would gain wisdom and grow in wisdom. And to that end, we need to diligently pray. We need to ask God by faith to give us the wisdom that he promises in his word. But we also need to be careful to give careful attention to God's commands and to obey them, to do that which he requires, because a wise life, or living wisely, is living obediently. And we also need to position ourselves, surround ourselves with persons that we can listen to and be guided by as they teach and reveal God to us. 
the good news that I hope you'll walk away with this morning, with an impression of, is that genuine wisdom, Christ-like wisdom, is within the reach of each and every one of God's children. Wisdom is within your reach. It's not a matter of how old you are. It's not even a matter of how long you've been a Christian. But are you asking God to give you wisdom? Are you living obediently to his commands? Are you listening to godly teachers? It's within your reach. Pursue wisdom. In Jesus' name, amen. Friends, it is our custom during worship to give our gifts of money, our tithes, and our offerings. Uh, Many of you, or perhaps even most of you, gave as you came in. Uh, For those of you who have not yet uh, given to the offering plate but would like to do so, uh, you may do that now. And and while that takes place, uh, let me just give a word to those who are giving online. Uh, We thank you for your support. Uh, It was noted in an email to the congregation some time ago uh, that we found ourselves in a very vulnerable financial position at the end of August and were in great need of a boost to continue to do ministry uh, as has been our custom. And I have not seen the September numbers, but I understand they are much stronger. And so I pray that that will continue uh, so that our ministry will continue uninterrupted and undiminished. Uh, And and with that, uh, I'll give you an opportunity to bring forward your gifts. And then following that, uh, Robert Farkason will bring the prayer of thanksgiving and intercession. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the word that was so ably preached. Thank you for your instruction that guides our lives and the understanding you give that helps us to not only run, but flourish spiritually. Thank you for giving us the capacity for wisdom in Jesus Christ, who's redeemed us and placed the fear of God in our hearts. Lord, it is you who give instruction but so many times we neglect it. Please forgive us for resembling more of the foolish than the wise. Father, we pray for our country, which has seen an uptick in cases of COVID-19. We pray for not only the numbers to decrease, but also that people would heed the safety protocols, if not for themselves, for their neighbors. We ask that you give comfort to the families who have lost loved ones. Grant them strength to continue life with the joy that you give. Show them true joy, which is the eternal life that you give. We pray for our governing officials that they make the necessary choices that benefit the people, no matter how painful. Guide them as as leading a country in a time like this is not easy. We ask that you continue to strengthen and build up our St. Andrew's Kirk family as we seek to stay connected while being lights in our community. We also pray for our pastor, who gives his best daily, We ask that you, who has called him, would restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish him to your honor and glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. After all this talk about praying for wisdom, uh, it wasn't hard to find a hymn where we can actually do just that. It is hymn number 92, God of Grace. 
and God of glory. give you all the wisdom you need for the week ahead. May his sufficient grace go with you, his steadfast love accompany you, and his ongoing presence and power help you today and forevermore through Christ our Lord. Amen.